Good morning. And what a wonderful morning it was, isn't it? <laughs> Need I explain why we are half an hour late? Or is it obvious? There were many obstacles along the way. I mean this both literally and metaphorically. There were many obstacles along the way. But this is the mission of the Sasa. We have the power of intelligence, the power of thought. We have determination, we have courage. We are here for a purpose. We are all here for that purpose, and so it is absolutely necessary for us all to do whatever we can to overcome all those obstacles. So both literally and metaphorically, those obstacles had to be overcome, and we did, and here we are. But I do apologize for those who have been waiting. There were floods along the way. You know the trek from here to the monastery, especially the last six or seven kilometers can sometimes be a little bit difficult, especially even when the weather is good. But yesterday night was typically bad around that part. But it had to be done. I've promised you, if ever there's a way, then we will find it. And so here we are. And besides, it's more than just a sermon that you want today to happen. I know that. It is obvious in the turnout today. How come they don't, so not so many come to my sermon? <laughs> but for some reason today, almost all of you have decided to come. So, it gives me the great honor and privilege to introduce to you, actually someone who needs no introduction, to be fair, but today he's here in a different guise. <clears throat> he's a changed man, transformed. He's given up his old life, but you've known him as Mr. Susit. You are part of the community that helped shape him to who he is today. And for over a year at the monastery, he was one of our Anagarikas. He trained with us. He practiced with us. He engaged in merits with us. He became part of our family. In fact, his whole family is now part of our family. His elder brother is, has, has been a monk with us for some time now. His mother is a Sila Shavika. Yes. So his whole family is with us. These are people who discovered the truth, people who were looking for the truth. I've been asking, I was talking about what his experience is like a monk, as a monk, and he says, it's incredible how my life changed since coming across the Dhamma. He related to me a story. He said, Sainan sir, my brother and I, many years ago before we came across the teaching, we loved our entertainment. We loved entertaining ourselves, we loved entertaining our friends, and that was what we were like. And so we built a house and in that house, we made, we made a special, there was a balcony on the top floor. And that balcony was particularly designed to entertain friends, guests, relatives, and so on. So both his brother and himself, they were very much into entertainment. And what he said was, we made that part of the balcony particularly so that we could enjoy ourselves and we could entertain, and it was more really for friends to come and have a drink. So he says, almost every weekend we would have friends around, 
and so usually we start with the drinks and then that conversation start flowing from one topic to another so we start talking about politics start talking about the economy and start talking about how they can change the world it's important to talk about the politics and all that even in america right because we can change all that if you don't like it hmm? so those were the conversations but then at the end of every conversation there would be just a little bit of dhamma just to make it everyone feel like you know you were still holy despite the bottle <laughs> most conversations they have a little bit of dhamma so that's how those conversations used to start and then one fine day we came across guru amru's teachings so that habit continued still the friends got together we had the drinks we had the conversations and a little bit of dhamma but after a while it became the drinks less politics more dhamma still further on it became drinks i was still there <laughs> drinks no politics and the dhamma and later on the drinks stopped as well and it was just the dhamma i said touche well done i mean that was incredible what a transformation he said yes so i mean that is true he said but the pity of it is the people who used to come and get together with us that changed as well along with our habits so there were those friends who used to come and get together with them who stopped coming when the politics stopped then there were those who stopped coming when the what stopped yes what stopped when the when the drinks stopped and then finally there were just a few left and then the dhamma continued so one of those friends were some neighbors those who stayed on even after the drinks had stopped even after the politics had stopped there were some neighbors and surprise surprise today those neighbors are also at the monastery the entire family mother father and children all at the monastery because the dhamma continued the dhamma survived and those within whom there was a paramita to complete this journey and to see the end of samsara they hung in there so our swami nahan say is from the hometown of migahavat so he says today we have myself and my brother two months from migahavat so migahavat is susima and now novice monk today is migahavat is susila and then he says soon enough the anagarika mahatma was the other anagarika from so the neighbor he will also become a monk so these are his plans he has a vision this is we call it the migahavat vision <laughs> so then he'll be the third from migahavat and then he, the, the the neighbors they have two two sons when they are dead then there will be two more once they come of then they once they turn 18 and complete their program then there will be five five months from migha so i said that must be the migha vatte paswag mahan <laughs> noble companionship see all it requires is one life to change and then those around them they slowly start to change sometimes you don't even know that there are people who have started to change because of you you may not realize this yet but those little changes that people begin to see within yourself ladies and gentlemen they are very important this is why i say please make sure you are safe before you cross the road you are a mission we are all on a mission and you are a mission every word that you utter it influences someone the way you conduct yourself it makes a change it gets people to think differently you know just to have a bunch of friends one guy used to drink he stops drinking people begin to wonder what's the secret so another guy watches music uh, films and listens to music all day long 
Then there may be another friend in the, in the group who is very much into the other sex. And then all these things, they slowly start to stop. And then people begin to wonder, what's making this change? And those who are seeking answers to life's riddles, they become interested. Then those conversations turn from politics and economics and whatever to the truth of life. Nibbana is all we talk about, Nibbana is all we do, Nibbana is all we think about, day in, day out. I could really resonate to what Susil Handel had to say. He might have struggled to get his ideas across. This is his first sermon as a bhikkhu. But the passion with which he spoke, no less. Time and time again he invited you, didn't he? He was telling you how he got here, the journey that he took, how his merits helped him come this far. And he was very wise. He realizes that, you know, these seats, someone comes and sits there, they get up, they go. Someone else comes, they take a seat, they go. The next one comes, they take a seat, they go. This is the seat of the sasa. The seat will remain, but those who sit there, they will exit. What I heard in his talk was an invitation to all of you. When are you going to come up to the seat? The seat will remain for another two and a half thousand or so years. That seems like a long period of time. It's two and a half thousand. Seems like a long time. But remember, it doesn't matter how long it is, if your life is only good for another 50 years, if it's only good for another 20 years, another 30 years. So that's what I heard in his talk. An honest, heartfelt invitation to all of you who have been part and parcel of his journey this far. An invitation for you all to take that step as much as you can, as far as you can. I agree that there will be some among you for whom this may not be a feasible option because of your duties, your responsibilities, your obligations. Fair enough. And for those, always ask yourself the question, have I gone as far as I can go? Is this as far as I can go? Can I do it more times of the week than just a Sunday morning? If you can, then do so. I want you all to understand that none of this is for anyone else but for yourself. What we say, what we do, the merits that we do, the dharma that we preach, the dharma that we practice, you are the beneficiary. It is you who benefit from them. So Zil Hamel has benefited, benefited from it. He has, made, he has made his life resolve that this will be his last one. And towards that cause, he is fighting. That's an internal battle. All we can do is facilitate that. We can't fight that battle on his behalf. Can we? You can offer arms to him. You can offer robes to him. You can offer pirikara, yes. But that battle he has to fight, fight alone. That is a lone fight. So if that is so for him, what is it for you then? You can have your friends to support you, to encourage you. You can have the monks to come and preach to you. We can create opportunities for people to engage in merits, but the fight that you have to do alone. And if, you, if that part does not happen, it matters not what the rest of it does. So there are two parts to this. There is the environment and then there is you. We can only create an environment for you. As the Buddha always said, I can only show the path. Getting there, walking there, is all down to each and every one of you individually. So, I echo his sentiments, I echo his call. Have a voice in the back of your mind, ladies and gentlemen, a voice that constantly keeps nagging at you. When? 
Even if the answer is not this time round, still just have that voice in the back of your head. When? Don't let that voice switch off. Don't mute that voice. Because it's very difficult to get that voice going. For some of you it will have happened, for maybe for most of you, maybe for all of you. You now have a voice in the back of your mind going, when? When do I end my journey of samsara? When do I complete this path? When do I actually commit myself entirely, fully, to the purpose of salvation? When? So I ask all of you to have that voice in the back of your head. Let it nag at you. Because unless you come across a Buddhasasana, you will never hear that voice. People are more or less interested in enjoying themselves, eating, enjoying, sleeping, enjoying, going out, enjoying, partying, enjoying music. This is what we've always known until we came across the Buddha. So now we have the sasana. Now we have everything going for us. Now we have everything aligned. The stars are aligned. We have the compass. So we know which way to head. We have a ship. Here's the vessel. That is the Dhamma. So, what remains is for the Savior. I can't save your boat for you. So, Silahandru can't do that. Guruhandru can't do that. We can show you. We can cast a beacon of light as to where you should be heading. But you have to be your own ship sailor. So sailors, ahoy! Get on board your ships. Because you can only do this while the tide is gone. Once the tide is gone, remember, time and tide, wait for no man. The time is right and the tide is here. You have a ship, the stars have aligned, there's a compass, so you know which way to go. Your ship is ready. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. You know, the good thing is, people don't remember their past. That's why people can just enjoy their lives as they do. You don't remember what happened before your birth, right? That's as far back as you can go. You, can't, you don't remember anything from, from before five years of age, maybe? Four, three years of age? No one remembers anything. Certainly not before your birth this time now. So what happened in your last birth? What happened 300 births ago, 500 births ago? The times that we have spent in the four great hells? That is what he was referring to as a Mahagadana. He wasn't referring to the monastery when he said that. That is one Mahagadana. But there's another Mahagadana where we spend most of our time in samsara. These are not his words, he's quoting the Buddha. That's the thing. You know, when the Buddha says something, you have to take it seriously. Because they're not speculations. He says because he knows. He says because he knows. The four great hells have, is where we have spent the most of our time. And you know what? You didn't have your mother, your father, your brother, your sister with you then. Your dear friends who you can't let go today, they were nowhere near when you were there. I didn't have any friends when I was there. When I was burning in the cauldrons of molten lava, there was no one to call for help. Someone said, still wonder, is the other four great hills really there, Swami Nansa? Do they really exist? Well, here's what I can say. If what you give is what you get, then for people who spend their lives giving, making life hell for others, hmm? there's an expression like that amongst ourselves, don't we? Isn't there? Is it, you just make hell, life hell for us. So if you make life hell for someone, then hell will be made for you. That's how it works. In almost every religion, they talk about hell. 
they'll tell you different reasons for getting there and how whether you can escape that or not, whether you know who's who who chooses whether you go there, whether there's a judgment day on which God decides that, or whether your own actions decide that. So there'll be different explanations as to how one gets to heaven. But pretty much every religion talks about heaven. So that's all there. We just don't remember how many times we've been there. That's all. And Sazil Amaru referred to a very uh, fantastic analogy that Buddha gave on one occasion. He said, if you cut down all the trees that cover the surface of the earth, and then cut down every branch, every twig, so that each piece was just six inches tall or six inches long, and you line them up, or you count them up, the total number of pieces that you have, you would have cut them down to is less than the number of times each individual has been a mother or a father to you in samsara. What does that tell you about how long we've been in samsara? This is not a joke. If anyone should think that this is a joke, then the joke is on you. This is no joke, ladies and gentlemen. Otherwise, the world wouldn't be so fair. I mean, you know, it, it can't be. For someone to spend their whole life trying to make another person's life miserable, for someone to spend their whole lifetime trying to make another person's life hell, by right? cheating on them, people who murder, people who thieve, adulterers, right? people who live their lives like that, if there was no justice, then that would be very unfair. But justice is always served. You don't need the courts for that. Trust me, you don't need the courts for that. You don't need the Supreme Court for that. There's a much greater court. There's a court that supersedes all other courts. That is the court of Dhamma. That is the court of karma. Karma and vipaka are above all. That is supreme. It's above all. Even the Buddha could not escape it. Even the Buddha was a victim of karma, but he found a way to come out of it. That is what makes the Buddha the Buddha. Remember last week we talked about, someone asked a question, how is it what you give, you always get back? And I tried to explain to you very briefly that it is not you giving or you getting, but rather the environment that determines this. That is what the Buddha helped us discover. He found that it is the environment that keeps drawing the vipaka that was generated when the karma was done. So if you can change the environment, you can change the vipaka from coming to fruition. That was the eureka moment for all of us in samsara, for all beings in samsara. That eureka moment, that epiphany, and that is what we're trying to understand through the lens of Dhamma. Today, these talks are simply to help you do that. But people live their lives because they think that the hells are simply a fantasy. That's just some story in a novel. Nothing like that has happened in the past. Nothing like that is going to happen in the future. Life is good as long as you have some, you know, three square meals, as long as you can live a good life, you have a house, you have a family, you have some pets, you have some friends to keep yourself happy, you can enjoy life. People think that this is it, you don't need to worry about the rest of it. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I, of all people, would be glad to hear that the four, the, the four great hells don't exist. I'd be, I'd be very happy to hear that, to learn that, but unfortunately, it is not true. The four great hells do exist. Just as the heavens do exist, just as the Brahma worlds do exist, just as the human world as we live in does exist. What you create in this moment, you create for your future. When you act of, with kindness and compassion towards all, you create an environment of kindness and compassion, which you deserve. When you create misery and grief and sorrow for all, then you create an environment of misery, grief and sorrow for yourself. Always remember this, what you give is what you get. That is the overarching phenomenon, the overarching principle, the law of everything. So that's the way it works. Our task effort our, here, our effort here, 
Now that we know that there are deeds we have done in the past which we cannot erase, we can all put our hands up and say, yes, we have done plenty of them. Sins we have committed in the past which we cannot erase, we can't undo them now. Lies which we have uttered, which might have ruined people's lives which we can't undo. Sins we might have done which might have broken families up into pieces which we can't undo. Sins of the flesh that we might have committed, which might have ruined families, which we can't undo. Lives we might have taken, which we can't undo. This is why we, have, we care a lot about the, the forces, the armed forces. That's why whenever we get an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, we invite them so that we can help them earn them for themselves a better future. Because if they've taken a life, then a life is to be taken. Yes, they fought for our country. It is because of them you and I are still alive. But if a life was taken, a life will be taken. Sometimes it is not just one life that is taken for one. It's not a one on one. It's not a one for one. Sometimes it's many hundreds of thousands per life. Because remember, although the action of taking one's life might be simply the pulling of a trigger, might be simply chucking a bomb at someone, right? Or might be simply stabbing someone with a dagger. It's not the actual deed that commits the karma. It's the chitta that commits the karma. You can't kill a man with one chitta, can you? You need many hundreds, if not thousands, maybe millions of chittas to commit that deed. So each of those chittas earns a karma. That's how terrible this is. Please open your eyes and realize. Please come to terms with what's going to happen. No deed can be done with a single chitta. If you hit someone because you're angry, seems fair, you're angry, you hit someone. Sometimes parents ask us, is it, is, it, is it fair to punish our children? When we hit our children, do we not earn demerits out of it? Well, the simple answer is, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter who you think, you know, what your reasons are. If you have anger within yourself and you raise your hand, you take that stick, now you're going to commit a crime. You have compassion towards your child, you have love towards your child, you earn some merits for that also. Because your intention is to do good, you earn some merits, but if there's a single chitta that has anger in it, that's a bad cover. That's why I sometimes advise parents, if, you're, if, if your child has done something bad and you get to know about it, and you're angry, don't punish them today, wait till the following day, if you can. See if you can do it. So you're angry today because your child has, you know, they've, they've broken a bus or something. Right? Or they've stolen something from you. And you've, you've come to learn that your child has committed a sin. You don't punish them today because you're angry today. The following day you say, Buddha, come. I'm going to punish you now. See if you can actually do it that way. You explain to him what you're going to do and then punish him or her. Usually what happens is, you go looking for the child, you first beat the child up, you first punish the child, the child doesn't know why they're being punished. And then later, once you've come back to your, your senses, you've composed yourself because now you've vented their frustration, that anger is all gone out of the system now. Now you have the right mind to tell him, like, why did you do that? Do what? Why did you break the vase? No, it wasn't me, Amma, it was a cat. It was a cat. You should have told me when I was beating you up. Yeah, but you were senseless. How could I tell you? Now, how do you undo it? You can't. So, you know, I was punished when I was a child. And I'm glad my parents did. But there was no one to teach my parents not to punish me if they were angry. There was no one to teach them that. Today, I want to give you that advice. It's always better if you can speak to your children and say, Buddha, I'm going to punish you. 
very calm, very collected, very cool. But I'm going to punish you now. I'm going to punish you because you did this. It was wrong of you to do that. Do you understand why it's wrong? So you must explain to them. Do you understand why it's wrong? Yes, I understand why it's wrong. They say, no, you explain them. This is why it's wrong. So now I'm going to punish you. Then you punish them. But if you do it when you're angry, it's not your child you're punishing. Who? Yourself. Try your level best, ladies and gentlemen, not to take action when you're angry. It's a terrible thing you do to yourselves. On the other side, you're, they are simply paying for the, the karmas they have done in the past. It's just their vipaka coming to fruition, right? On the other side, they're receiving it. But on your side, if you ever act when you're angry, don't trust your actions. Because they're simply actions that are committed to free yourself from vexation. You will regret that. Sometimes you may not remember the deed that was done to regret it, but you will regret it. Don't you regret today the karmas you've done in the past? When you get a splitting headache, when you get a bad back, when you feel aches and pains, it's quite possible that these are karmas you've done in the past, inflicting pain on other people. The Buddha had, uh, gave plenty of stories like that. He had an uncurable or an incurable backache. And that was because he had hit, he had attacked a relative of his, a cousin of his, once when he was you know, in a previous, previous birth. They'd been wrestling. And on one of those occasions, he'd broken his back. Because he wanted to show that he was supreme. He was superior. So he attacked and he broke his back. And for that, he had to pay the price even after having become a Buddha. That's what I'm saying. Even the Buddha cannot escape. Karma and Vipaka is all. It's everything. That's all there is. That's all there ever will be. So we are all susceptible to that. We are all vulnerable to that. We are all victims of that, ladies and gentlemen. Kamma sakomi, kamma daya, kamma yoni, kamma bandhu, kamma patisattva, yam kamma karissami, kalyanam apa kamma, tassa daya do bhavisami, papa jiten abhinna, bhacca kitab bandhu, the Buddha says. He says, a papa jiten, or a monk, this is an advice that the Buddha gives, a piece of advice the Buddha gives to monks. He says, live your life reflecting on the fact that every time you experience something, whether that is good or bad, these are simply, 100%, completely, entirely, and comprehensively the fruits of your own actions. No one else is to blame. What is the value of reflecting on this? Because when you reflect on this, ladies and gentlemen, when you have to suffer for your own actions, you never take it out on another person. That's the worst thing you can do. It's just like drinking seawater when you're stuck in the middle of the ocean and you're thirsty. It's the worst thing you can do because every sip you take makes it. That's what to you. Makes you thirsty, right? So every time you're suffering due to the consequences of your own actions, if you take it out on another person, what are you doing again? You're planting the seeds for the same thing to happen again. How foolish is that? This is what people who don't understand this do. I'm trying to save you all from that. But when you're angry, sometimes it's too late. This is why we preach the Dhamma, so that you don't become angry in the first place. That's the thing. Prevention is always better than cure. We preach the Dhamma so that your mind doesn't go into a state of vexation. Because when you, when you fall, when you become angry, it's very difficult to not do something about it. At least you feel like saying something. Something hurtful to someone. You know, whether you can, you might be able to restrain yourself 
and not actually attack them or hit them physically, but something will generally come out of your mouth. Words that you will later regret. Is there anyone in this room who can, who can say that I'm innocent of that? I've never done something like that, Swami Nansa. I've always weighed my words. I've always made sure that every word that came out of my mouth was only meant to make someone happy, never to make someone unhappy. There's none of us in the room who can, who can claim that. that honor. Because we were all victims of ignorance and attachment. That is why we are still in samsara. When anger bites you, you bite back. That's what happens. Sometimes you don't realize when you, you, know, you lose your senses, right? You, you, become, you become another animal. People say, you know, don't bring out the what in me? The devil in me. People say that, don't they? Don't bring out the devil in me. How many times at our monastery do we have sometimes young couples? They walk up to and say, Swami Nasa, he was not like this before we got married. But ever since we got married, I've seen a very different side to him. Today, sometimes he's just like an animal. When he gets angry, all hell breaks loose. And today, the safest thing I can do is to leave home, go to my parents or something. Or at least I walk outside and go into the outhouse until he's settled down. Because once he gets angry, He's ferocious. The same is also said about the other gender. Some men come up and say, Swami Nansa, before I got married, she was not like this. She was an angel. Then she was an angel, angel but today she attacks me from every angle. There's no escape when she's angry. When she goes into a state of fury, a fit of fury, no escape. Then she forgets she's a mother. And she starts saying things that should never be uttered in the presence of children. This happens to people. You are not the only ones. Remember what we said, we talked about this. There are no such things called bad people. Badness gets people. I need you to look at it in this way because this is the truth. Badness gets people. It destroys the goodness in people. If you don't listen to these things, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't take this, this advice on board, if, if, if the youth of today don't take this advice on board, you can't stop domestic violence. You can't. The answer to domestic violence is not Netflix. It does not cure it. You know, just because the husband and the wife, they put their feet up, put the TVs on, and you know, watch movies till the evening, till the weekend, all weekend, that does, not, that does not help unite the family. It's not the answer. Going on trips is not the answer. Let's cook something nice so that we can just forget our problems. That's not the answer. Crying till you wet the pillow is not the answer. The answer lay in the Dhamma. I urge you, if you want to get married, find someone who's understood the Dhamma to get married to. Chances are they won't want to get married. But if you want to have any luck at living a happy life, try and find someone whose happiness does not depend on you. It seems, sounds ironical though, doesn't it? Just saying it out loud. Right? If you want to get married to someone, find someone who, whose happiness does not depend on you. Then you will ask, why do I bother getting married to some person like that? That's the point. That is the point. Because if their happiness depends on you, now they will call that, they, they, it will matter to them what you do and what you don't do. It will upset them when you don't do what they want you to do. It will hurt them when you don't say what they want you to say. Now they will become a dictator. That's not a marriage. 
That's not a marriage. Everyone has a story. Go into your own lives, you'll find plenty of these stories. <clears throat> but each time, whether it was you or the other party, if you're the husband, the wife, the wife, and you're the husband, plenty of times, I'm sure, in your own households, you will know, have had fights, brawls, altercations, arguments. Some might have been verbal attacks, others might have been physical attacks. You know, two, two, two people who, who couldn't get enough of each other, they decided let's live under one roof, let's be together, let's be a family. Let's, let's make a family, let's create life. This is what they decided to do. They didn't do the one thing that they had to do, which was to take in the Dharma. So what did they do? They started living together under one roof. They forget that beauty only lies in the eyes of the beholder. So the superficial attraction, that dies out for a while. It always does. We can today explain it through the science. Through the, through the science of Buddhist philosophy, how beauty is only relief from vexation experienced by the mind. So, the more times you keep seeing the same thing, the beauty fades away. The beauty of it fades away. That's why people tend to cheat after a while. Some people are not married to just one person, they're married to many people. But there's only one certificate of marriage, one marriage certificate, but they're married to many people. Some relationships are on Facebook, other relationships are on WhatsApp, other relationships are at the, work, at, at the workplace. Other relationships are on... I'm not going to say they're not love. They're on the streets of Colombo. I have nothing against any of these people because I love them just the same. The difference between the love that you experience from the rest of your family and the love that you experience from the Mahasangha is that the Mahasangha's love is unconditional. It matters not who you are or what you do. The Mahasangha loves you the same because all they say is a mind that vexes. I wouldn't be able to love you this way if I expected you to behave in a certain way. If I expected you to give me something that I want, then I couldn't love you the same way, because then I'll be partisan, I'll be biased. I'll make you happy if you can make me happy, those kind of relationships. That's what I call dirty love. It's not your love. I don't wish to speak badly about you know, your relationships and so on, but I'm saying this is the truth. I'm asking all of you to step up, to become individuals who can love everyone unconditionally. Only the Dhamma can help you do that. But many people, although they get married and they, they, they sometimes you know they run away, they elope. Right? Sometimes they bring great sorrow to their parents, to their families. All because they want to, they, they think to themselves that they can live together and they can live together happily. So they run away, somehow try and find a place to live in. Somehow the, the man or the woman, they go and find some work. Sometimes just, you know, menial income. But in their minds, they think, right, I'm just going to enjoy my life together. I've found the love of my life. Right? Life from here on is going to be amazing. And they forget all the practical problems, like right? light bills, water bills, electricity bills, and all that. You know, because now you're thinking from the heart, not from the brain. That's what happens when, emotional, when you get emotionally locked down, the brain switches off and people forget all this stuff. They get overwhelmed emotionally. 
But the thing is this, ladies and gentlemen, how many days can you live when you open the tap and water doesn't come out? When you, when, if you, the, you know, because we're all used, we're all accustomed to basic commodities, the basic facilities and the basic amenities. We're used to that. People, human beings are used to it. They're used to sleeping on a comfortable bed because that's what the girl did when she was at home. Her parents doted on her. She was the apple of her mother's and father's eyes <coughs> and they gave her and provided her with everything. But one fine day, she met this guy and the boy said, I love you. And then she thought, well, that's it. This is all I've been waiting for. My life, all my life's dreams, my hopes and ambitions have just come to, come to life. What do my parents know? They don't know about any of this. They don't know how to make me happy. This boy knows how to make me happy. So they work on a date, they decide on a date, and then they run away. Because in their fantasy world, all they need now, because they, they still know she has the mattress at home. So she doesn't think about what am I going to do without the mattress. Because she has the mattress at home, the only thing that she's missing is a boy. So now she has a boy. Then she, they decide to run away, and the boy says, you know, let's, let's somehow make, make it work. Remember, when the mind is vexed, it will always find a way. So then they run away. But now the boy is there, but she's hungry. When the boy made the proposal, she wasn't hungry, because the mother had just made her a, a hearty meal. But now the boy is the boy's there, but there's no food on the plate. There's no mattress. She has to sleep on the floor. She opens the tap and there's no water. In fact, there's even no tap. You have to go to the well. Then the, 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 the basic comforts of life that she had gotten used to, none of them are, are there now. Slowly but surely, these are going to begin to hurt her. Now she's going to start to feel the vexation of it. But the boy's there. But that was a mere infatuation. They didn't think it through. If they had, this wouldn't have happened. But now she begins to suffer. She begins to now expect the boy to provide for her, which the boy can't do because she, he doesn't have a job. He doesn't have a reference. He can't get a police check. He can't get any of those things because he's run away. They both run away. So now life becomes incredibly difficult. Then come the fights. And then she says, you promised me. Hmm? You promised me that you would look up to me. You promised me you would feed me. And the boy said, well, you knew what you were getting yourself into. Is this a surprise to you? Did you not know that I didn't have a job? Is my love for you not enough? Yeah, but love doesn't put food on the plate, does it? It doesn't feed this man's hunger. Now they start having fights. But now they can't go back home either because they burned down all those bridges. The family have disowned, disowned them. So the only thing that's left to do now is what? Get a rope, put it around your neck, and hang yourself. The sorry end to a tale of forbidden love. Do you think I'm making this up? Things like this have never happened. Happens every day. All the you know, young lives ruined. All because the people growing up, they own, oh, there's, there's only one thing they know. If the mind is vexed, go looking for your vex relief from vexation. Never have we learned that the answer to vexation is to eradicate vexation, not to look for freedom from vexation, not to look for relief from vexation. Because we are, we are a, a generation who have lived with our televisions, we have lived with our computers, we have lived with the internet, we have lived with the mobile phones. 
we've lived with access to everything we've needed. So therefore, everything is there, everything's instantly available. And once you grow up in that, in that culture, in that kind of environment, if that's what you get used to, now the mind has no patience. You can't bear. Tolerance has never been so low among people. That's why people can't tolerate each other. Enough evidence you can find when you start driving on the streets, right? People can't tolerate each other. You can't tolerate another person's weakness. You can't tolerate a, flow, a fault, a flaw. You can't. By you, I don't mean you. I mean people in general. They can't. Because they're vexing. Hurt people hurt people. When they're hurt, all they're looking for is relief from, from that vexation. That's why we're always going on about this like a, like a broken record. There's only one answer to this problem, and that is the Dhamma. Whether you're young or you're old, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're black or white, ladies and gentlemen, the Dhamma is the only remedy to the mind's problems. Your physical problems can be addressed by giving you some food, by giving you shelter, by putting a roof above your head, dressing you up in something. But your mental, psychological problems, the only answer lay in the Dhamma. And we have that. It is our privilege and our honor to have that today because the Buddhist asana still exists. That is why the Venerable Monk spoke to you earlier and said, before this comes to an end, before this asana expires, you try and expire your sansara. If not, you'll be lost again like an animal in a desert. Every other comfort is simply a mirage. How many times have you watched TV this, by this point in time? Whenever you, want, whenever you felt like watching TV, you, were, you walked up your TV, switched it on, and you watched it. Has that made you happy? Has that made you content? Has it answered the problem of wanting to watch TV? Has it? No, and that's why you still have a TV at home. See, it's not an answer. It's simply scratching a rash. It's not the answer. It's never the answer. When you feel like you want sensual comforts, if you go after it, that is never the answer. Because the more you go after it, the thirstier you will get. The more hungry you will get. What pleases you today does not please you tomorrow. You know this. If a little bit of something makes you happy today, that little bit cannot make you happy tomorrow. You need more than that. You need twice as much. This is how people get addicted to drugs. It's the same principle. If today, a little bit of it is fine to knock you out, tomorrow you need twice the dose. The following day, three times as much. Then after, four times as much. What does that tell you about drugs? It does not give you happiness. Because if it did, then one shot, it would be all you need. It doesn't work like that. So if drugs are that bad, I mean drugs are terrible because, actually drugs are not that bad, to be fair. Because there's only so much you can take. It breaks your body. It deteriorates your health. And it destroys you physically. Yeah? Drugs can do that too. If you take narcotics, right, these drugs, they destroy you. Methamphetamine, ice, these drugs, they completely destroy people's lives. So if a, if a boy starts taking drugs by, by, say, 14, by the time, before he reaches 20, he's dead. Oh yeah, before he's 20, he's dead. Six years is more than enough time. More than enough time. So you can't do more harm than that to yourself. Six years is all the harm you can do to yourself. But what about watching TV? When did you start watching TV, I ask you? When did you start watching TV? You always had one at home, right? Maybe your mother fed you by sitting in front of the TV and showing you Teletubbies. Buddha, watch that Buddha. You watch it with your mouth. Gaping open, right? And then your mother just put stuffed things into your, into your mouth. That's how she fed you. 
you watch Teletubbies, she fed you. You didn't even know you were eating. That was when you were six years old. Today you are 60 years old and you still have a TV. <coughs> See, that's the thing. The TV doesn't kill you. It doesn't let you die. That's the problem. You know what's worse than something that doesn't kill you? Hmm? What's worse than something that doesn't kill you? Something that doesn't let you die. That's worse. Because what kills you, kills you. That's the end of the problem. But what doesn't let you die, it will make you suffer perpetually. That's why I said at the beginning, we can only live happily like this because we don't remember how many times we've owned TVs in the journey of samsara. Today you bring home a nice white TV and you think, wow, I never owned a TV like this. I'm a happy man. You, you forget how many TVs you owned in your lifetime in samsara. This is not the TV. This is not the first TV. The TV doesn't let you die. Sensuality doesn't let you die. Lust doesn't let you die. And it doesn't kill you either. That's the problem. See, a fire is dangerous because it kills you. But it's not as dangerous as the fire of lust. You know what the Buddha says? Nakti rago samanaki. I'm not making this stuff up. The Buddha said this in his own words. There is no fire like the fire of desire, he says. And the reason for that, the fire of desire doesn't let you die. A forest fire, if you get caught, it kills you. A house fire, it kills you. Someone burns your house down while you're asleep. The, the, the house burns and you're in there, you, you burn as well. You're dead, that's it. End of problem. You're, of course, you're born with the next birth and then you have to start again. But the burn doesn't continue. Once you're dead, who, man, what, what, you know, who, who, it doesn't matter. Who cares how much you burn once you're dead? But desire doesn't let you die. That is why we have made it our life's purpose to share the gift of Dhamma so that people can come out of the misery that they live, that they live in. You know how difficult it is, ladies and gentlemen, when desire gets you. You know this, you've experienced this. You know, let's cut to the chase. Let's not pretend like, you know, we've never had that, not, none of the such things, no such thing has ever happened to us. You know what happens to you when desire gets you. I'm not even talking about lust. Just think about desire. When you feel like you have to have something, when you feel like you want to eat something, when you feel like you want to be with someone, just think about how far you're willing to go. And if you can get it, you feel happy. But then you realize that now what you've got, you have to keep safe. So therefore, it, it, it not, does not bring an end to the misery. But when you can't get it, now you, you suffer because you, you just can't get it. How many sleepless nights might you have had? How many pillows have you wetted? Just crying night to dawn. Those moments where you were angry, because when a mind vexes, there are two things a mind would do. Either get angry or be sad. One of these two things. In either of two, these two instances, you suffer. That's it. There's never been a moment in your life where you have wanted something and been happy. Name one if you can. Just one. A moment in your life where you wanted something and been happy at the same time. It cannot have happened because when you want something, your mind is in a state of vexation. Now you live in fear of whether you might or not get it. Then eventually you try and acquire it. You go through various... You, do, you, 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 you try yourself out if need be. You try and acquire it. And once you've acquired it, now you have to keep it safe. Again you are in fear. What if someone takes it from you? Because your happiness is conditional. It's based on the, on the presence of that object. Eventually, time or tide takes it away. And once it does, now you are in grief. 
So when you, whenever you wanted something, you've never been happy. It has come to the point in your lives, ladies and gentlemen, where you need to understand that the only way a human being can be happy is by freeing themselves of all wanting. There is no other answer. If there were, I wouldn't come all the way from India to come and preach to you. If there were, but there is no other way. Leave me to a side. The Buddha would not have come into this world. In fact, the Buddha says, if there is if there is even a modicum of happiness to be experienced in this world, just a modicum of happiness, the Buddha, Buddhas would not come into this world. There is no happiness to be found in this world. So whenever you feel happy about something, if that happiness is based on something you have just experienced, based on something you have acquired, based on something you have just seen, something you've heard, something you've smelt or tasted, something you have phys enjoyed the physical touch of, Stop fooling yourself. At least in those moments, tell yourself, this is not real happiness. This is simply a moment where the mind has gone from vexation to relief from vexation. That is all I'm experiencing right now. This joy has not come to me from the external world. Keep telling yourself this truth. So that one day at least you might understand it and comprehend this truth so that you stop feeling this nonsensical joy this, this pleasure that you experience, because it is completely based in your suffering. So I always say, beauty is the altar of your happiness. It's a sacrifice. Whenever you experience beauty, you're sacrificing your happiness on behalf of that. Every time and every time you got into trouble, it was because you saw beauty. How many times have I seen, I have personally seen people who get beaten up in buses, in public transport, because they, they see beauty. Right? There's a man on the bus, he sees a girl, and he wants to experience that. Some of you may have been victims of this, ladies perhaps, even gents. Children often are victims of this. School-aged children often become victims of this. I've personally seen. But the thing is this, now they have a rash, and the rash needs scratching. Because it's itchy, so it needs scratching. They have no alternative, they don't know the Dhamma. You know, initially they they'll tell themselves, if I do this, you know, there are people watching, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get in a real trouble, I better not do this. So they try and look away. They try and they try and think of something else, just like you. There are times when you try and think about something else, don't you? It's like when you're in grief, you try and think about something else. When you've lost someone you love, right, and the thoughts come, keep coming back, you try and think of something else. People do that all day long. They try and think of something else. If you lose someone in the family, right, until, until enough time has passed by where you have come to terms with it, Unless you have the Dhamma, the only, the only option seems to be like to try and think about something else. <clears throat> That's why during these three times people look, look for therapy. And what do ten people tend to do when they're sad? They sleep. Is sleeping an answer to a problem? When you wake up, isn't the problem still there? I mean, you have, you have a, a water bill to pay. It stresses you out. Now you sleep. When you wake up, what's happened to the bill? Paid? It's still there, right? You have a debt to pay. Because you want to get your, take your mind off things, you watch a film. You go out, you watch a movie, and you come back home. What's happened to the debt? It's still there. If anything, now you have to pay more interest on it because you've delayed paying the debt off. But don't you see people doing these kind of things? They're stressed out from a week's work. So what they do is they take a weekend and they go on a trip somewhere. They come back from their trip and they still work. You can't wish work away. It doesn't work like that. I remember because I've done this myself. When I had no Dhamma to take refuge, 
All I knew was what people <laughs> taught me. So every year we'd book ourselves a holiday. I remember when I was in the UK, yeah, we, we'd book ourselves a holiday and we'd plan it. We'd save up our holidays, three weeks, four weeks, and then we'd plan the holiday. And we'd spend a week in some resort, we'd spend another week by the beach, we'd spend another week at home, right? we'd spend another week with someone else, doing things, doing shopping, whatever. Because in that week, you didn't have to think about work. Or in the, during the holiday, you didn't have to think about work. So after the three, four weeks have passed, now you have to get back on a jet and fly back to fly back home. And then the following Monday, what do you have? Work. And an inbox full of emails that you now have to address because you've been out of the office for three weeks. Have you never felt that sometimes taking a holiday is the worst thing you've done for yourself because when you come back there's more work than when you left? More problems to resolve, more complaints, more issues, more problems, more emails, more reports to be done. It's just a rat race of a life. Where's the, where's the contentment? Where's the end to this? How come it's okay for human beings who are an intelligent species to keep going through this you know, year on year on year on year on year? Some people come up and say, Swami I have worked at my company for 21 years. I've been very loyal to my organization. I've worked at my company for 30 years. I've been very loyal to my company. So he asked him, so what did they give you for those 30 years? They gave me a plaque. See, they gave me a plaque. So you, you gave 30 years of human life and they gave you a plaque. Yes, they gave me a plaque, Swami Namaste. And they gave a good send-off as well. So everyone at, in, at, at the workplace, you know, they, we had balloons, there was confetti, and they had drinks, and they had food, and they had a surprise party for me. There was a fantastic send-off. And you gave what for this? 30 years. So we sit them down and ask them, right, so you work for 30 years of your life, yeah? Yes, son. Yes. And I have a black song. Yeah, you talked about the black. Right, you work for 30 years of your life, right? Are you happy now? I'm happy that I worked for 30 years of my life. No, 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 I'm not talking about the 30 years of your working life. Are you happy now? Are you content? Are you fulfilled? That I'm not so. Do you still feel disappointed? Yes. Do you feel angry? Yes. Do you feel sad? Yes. If your wife would leave you today, how would you feel? Distraught? So, 30 years of your life, what have you gained? Well, I built my house, it's now two stories high. I've been around the world. My work paid for that. I've got a nice car. Are you happy though? Hmm. So what good is the house if you're not happy? What good is the land if you're not happy? When you, when you die and go, sir, what are you gonna, what, which of these things are you going to take with you? Your plaque? 30 years of your life. Does this ring a bell? For any of you? <coughs> Don't look for answers where no answers exist. Don't. You are better than that. Your merits are so powerful, they have brought you to the Dhamma and Ladies Right? As I always say, don't under undermine yourselves. Don't think of yourself lightly. 
I'm here because I respect you. I'm here because I regard you highly because I realize that you must have been a bunch of people who in the journey of samsara have done tremendous amounts of things. Because today I realize the profoundness of this Dhamma. Having realized the profoundness of this Dhamma, today I realize that for someone to be able to, to have the, the patience, to have the, the time, to have the, the, the vigor to come and take these talks day in, day out, week on week, they must have tremendous amounts of merit. They must have. Because we don't give you free gifts for coming here. There's no other gain you get from coming here. So it must be your merits. So now that you have come across this teaching, please make a promise to yourselves that you don't, you will not look for happiness where happiness does not exist. Don't look for answers where answers don't exist. Don't look for the truth where the truth does not exist. Don't look for the light, where light does not exist. <coughs> Everything you've done until now, until you came across the Dhamma, you did in darkness, pitch black darkness. There was never going to be a way you were going to find what you were looking for. It was pitch black dark. Your presence here is evidence of that. We have all come from various worlds of life. Right? Every Swami knows that our monastery will have a story to tell. Some will have traveled the world, some will have, you know, some will have lived reckless lives. There are some who are not proud of the lives that they have lived. Some will have lived very playful lives. Not very happy about that, not very proud. But today they have realized that none of those things actually brought them any happiness. Happiness can only be found in the Dhamma. So what, what is my ask of you? What is my call to action, if you like? My call is this. You will from time to time experience moments where you vex. At least once a day. More like. All day. Because you know what will happen is as you as you progress in the path, you will become more and more sensitive to these vexations. Initially, you may not sense how much you vex actually. Initially, you might sense like when you know if you see the dog has done its thing on the on the carpet, then you think, oh, that's the point when I get angry. That then you, then you then you feel upset and you you're bothered and now you're annoyed. You think those are the moments where you feel angry, but these are going to be those moments when you first start out. When you first start out, these are the these are the biggies. The biggies you will experience initially. For the little things, you'll miss completely. Later on with your practice, you'll become more and more sensitive. And then there's going to be a time where, even when someone calls you by your name, and you feel that it is you who they're referring to, you will tell yourself, that's wrong. I can't feel that. It will become so subtle. If someone addresses you by your name and you turn your head, you feel that they are addressing you, right? There's no problem with that. But there'll come a point where you recognize that that itself is a problem because you are not that individual. You are not a self. You are simply the perception of a self. So if someone calls you by a name that is merely a convention, if you feel that that is my name, it is me that they are referring to, that they are calling, then that itself becomes a problem. So you will go from the dog has done, the, done its thing on the carpet to I perceive a self. If you want to look at the same thing twice, when you drive home, see whether this, not, whether this doesn't happen a lot. As you drive home, you look outside the window, right, and you see things, and you, you turn your head twice. Just look at it again. Because something of interest. I'm not asking you to stop doing that. Because in, in Buddhist philosophy, in the, the practice that we do here, is, you know, we don't do anything forcefully. Unless it's an unmeritorious deed. The ten unmeritorious deeds, the, the, sin, the sinful things, don't do it at any cost. And don't try it. Don't trial it. Just don't do it. Full stop. 
Why is that? Because if you give hell, you will get hell. That's why. But the other things, if you want to look at something twice, if you want to smell something twice, in those moments, what I'm asking you is not to stop doing it or not to force yourself from, from doing it. What I'm asking you to do is contemplate. Ask yourself, why did I do that? Why you did something is more important than what you did. Always. Why you did something is far more important than what you did. Because one of these days you'll also see a Rathan Mahansa, he'll also look twice. And then you'll say, ah, oh, no, these people, they don't cut his mouth. You can't say that because we don't know why he did it. But my ask of you is when you, when you live every day, remember what Susila Amru said. Today you have noble companionship maybe once a week. But that was not enough for him. Therefore, he stopped being a pot plant and he grounded himself in this asana. So now he has it 24 7. From waking up in the morning to going to bed at night, someone is always watching him to make sure that he doesn't do anything that hurts or harms his progress in environment. That is a noble companionship he has been so meritorious to, to have in his life. But here's the thing. Until you come and join our family, that family, I mean the family at the monastery, you have to be wherever you are. You're here on a Sunday, you get the Dhamma. But the rest of the time, you're out there. You're in the wild. Forgive me for using that expression, but that is what it is, you're in the wild. In those moments, you will see things, you will smell things, you will taste things, you will experience things. People will say things to you. Don't fail in those moments. Whenever I offer a penny thread, a penny thread to someone, I always tell them the penny thread, the objective of the penny thread is to remind you that you are a Buddha Putra. You are someone who must always be vigilant, who must always think and perceive things consciously and wholesomely. Look at things through the Dhamma. So when there are things that that, that meet your eyes, there are things that, 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 that come, through, you, come to your, through your ears, when, I think, when there are things, when you have experiences about whatever lets you know, take a moment to ask yourself, why did I look at it twice? If you look at this and you look at it again, ask yourself, don't stop yourself, just ask yourself, why did I look at it twice? What did I look for? Did I see beauty in it? If you saw beauty in it, now is the time to contemplate. Let's reflect on that. Then start reflecting, reminding yourself of the Dhamma that you've learned here. How we've discussed that beauty is not in the object, but beauty is merely a creation of the mind. Think about that. This is meditation. Bhavita Bahuli Karta. That is what the Buddha asked us to do. To use it and to use it repetitively, rigorously. Time and time and time again, use it. Use what? What is the it here? Use the Dhamma. Use the Dhamma. I often use the analogy of the glasses, right? These glasses. Without them, my vision is blurred. So when I can't see things clearly, I go to the opti optician. The optician checks me out. He does a dumb test and he says, you need a pair of glasses. Now the obsession prescribes for me a pair of glasses and he says, wear them. So what do I do? I get my glasses and I put them on. Now what am I looking at? The same thing I was looking at before, right? I'm not looking at the glasses, am I? I'm looking through the glasses, not at the glasses. That is how we use the Dhamma. The Dhamma is a lens through which you look at the world. What people do is look at the world like this. Not through the lens of Dhamma. So they, their vision is blurred. So where there are the five aggregates, they, they see beings. Where there is Rupa Vedana Sanya Sankar Vinyana, they see a wife, a husband. They see sentient beings, that's what they see. 
They see entities where there are only aggregates. But when you put the glasses back on, now just the aggregates. Now your vision is clear, not blurred anymore. Have you ever seen someone doing this, looking at the glasses and walking along the street, looking at their glasses? It's not the glasses that should, they should have been given then, right? A slap behind the head, because they're crazy. You don't get a pair of glasses and keep looking at the glasses. You put them on and look at what you've always been looking at. See, this is called studying the Dhamma. Studying the Dhamma. See, I'm studying the Dhamma. That is not what we need to do. We study the world, the world out there, through the Dhamma. This is a filter. No lie can get through. Falsehoods can't get through. This is the filter of truth. The four noble truths. Put the four noble truths and look at the world. That is what the sasana is. We are not here to study the Dhamma. We are, studying, we are here to study the world through the Dhamma. What is the world after all? Sights, sounds, smell, taste, touch and thoughts. In Singhala Jivalanda, the Rupa, Shabda, Gandha, Rasa, Sparsha, Dhamma. So we study the world through the Dhamma. That's what we are here to do. So when people don't have the Dhamma, they're either blind or they have real blurred blur vision. So therefore, no wonder they go bumping into people. No wonder they go and fall into pits. No wonder they can't go straight. Because they can't see things clearly. So therefore they suffer. If I didn't wear my glasses on, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be able to go very far. If I try to get down those stairs, I might fall. And then what happens to me? I suffer. <coughs> but once I put the glasses on, I'm fine. Now I can see the, the steps for what they are. I can see where things are. I can see clearly. So I don't bump into things. So therefore I don't hurt myself. That is the analogy that I want you to think about. So when you are out there living your life, ladies and gentlemen, Sights, let the sights come, let sounds come, let smells, taste and touch come to you. Your task is not to stop them. Therefore, the meditation that I, I believe is not a meditation where you have your eyes shut. You don't need to have your eyes shut. Have your eyes wide open. So sights will keep coming through your eyes. See, let's just say, as a monk, right? If there was a, if, if a woman would come into the monastery, if a girl would walk into the monastery, let's say dressed scantily, you know, in revealing clothes. I would look away for this reason and this reason alone. If someone were to look at me, if someone were to see me, they'd say, Swami Nath is looking at the girls. For that reason, I would look away. Because they'd say that I'm insulting the sasana, that I'm being unvirtuous. I, I don't mind the, I don't, I don't mind the, 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 the blame, but then they'll believe, they'll think that the sasana has done nothing for people. So then therefore they'll walk away. How many people have we come across in our lives? I, sometimes we don't get to actually get to see them, but we get to hear about them from others who have compassion towards them. Many times people come up to say, after and say, Swami Nivan said, I have, a, I have my, 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 my father, I, I have my husband, I have my wife. They like the Dhamma. But they would never step into a monastery or a temple because they believe that the monks of today are so unvirtuous, they're just dirty. They're unskillful. They're unvirtuous. They have come into the sasana for nefarious reasons. 
They're just terrible. They're just bad. They've either come for the money, they've come for the wealth, they've come for the property, they've come for the assets, they've come for a free meal. And the way they conduct themselves is just horrendous. So therefore they have lost faith in the Sambuddha's asana. Isn't that terrible? See, that's like having the merit to have a cake but not having enough minutes to eat it, right? That's the best analogy I can say, I can give you. You have a cake, but you can't eat it. So they have the sasana, but they can't benefit from it because they don't wish to come up and speak to a Swami Nansi. Because they fear that they might lose something. If I go and talk to Swami Nansi, he'll ask me for something. He'll ask me to build the pagoda. He'll ask me to build the dhamma hall. He'll ask me to do this, he'll ask me to do that. He'll ask me to pay the road. He'll ask me something, and I have to, I have to cough up my hard-earned cash. Right? They're like leeches, blood suckers. These are things we get to hear. Not from people who have understood what we are and what we are, what we stand for, but there are those who, from time to time, they come and accuse us of that. Because they don't understand that the sasana is somewhere you invest for a return. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a bank account. You put something in there to get something more out of it. But they don't think that. They think that, uh, they think that the sasana is for charity. You give something away because they need you. No, you don't give the sasana because they need you. You give the sasana because you need you. That's why. But people don't realize that. So there's that. And then people have fallen out of the sasana. They, they have fallen out of love with the sasana. So therefore, if a woman would come into the monastery, Maybe a low cut top, right? Or, or some revealing clothes. I would look away. So you would never see me staring at her. For the only reason that someone who sees me doing that would say, see, Swami Nahan say, is having lewd thoughts and she's, he's looking at her and you wonder what he's thinking of her in his mind. Because you know, when, when people think like that, they think others also think the same. It takes one to know one, so that's what people say. Right? If I feel like that, then of course Swami Nanda is also going to feel like that. But that is not the real sasana. My meditation is such that not a half clad woman, a naked woman, if you put one in front of me, I'd look at her with my glasses. Where most will fail, I won't. Because what I will see is not a woman. What I will see is the Panchaskana. This is Rupa. This is Vedana. This is Sanya. This is Sankha. This is Vigna. Now where is room for lust? If all you see is an aggregation of matter and energy, where is room for lust? See, when you have the Dhamma, you, need to, you needn't fear what comes in front of your eyes. When you don't have the Dhamma, you are always worried. How many wives live in fear that their husbands might be approached by a woman who they think is prettier or better looking than them? Hello? So, so how can a couple live a happy life? I'm asking you. If you're constantly living in fear that, you know, what if someone might come and interest my husband? What if someone better looking than me might, might get his attention? And if you're walking down the street, if you can't just keep looking straight because you have to keep looking at where he's looking. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what kind of relationship is that? Why did, why did you get into that? Where's the happiness? And if the husband has to keep saying, who's that, who's that message from? Why did you mute your phone? Who's ringing? Let me check your phone. Who sent you that message? If the, if the husband has to keep doing that, and the wife has to keep doing the same thing the other way around, right? and they say, this is because I love her. The husband says, it's because I love her. 
because I love her, I want to make sure that no one else gets her. That's love. That's love. <laughs> I call it money love. Honestly, that can't be love. Folks, rise and shine. Come out of the ashes of your ignorance. Rise up from the ashes of your ignorance. <gasps> Set aside the burden of your attachments. Experience the bliss of unconditional happiness. You create your own suffering. You trap yourself inside a prison. You lock it from the inside. And then you say, I'm in prison, someone get me out. You're the one who closed the door, you're the one who turned the lock, and the, lock, the key is in the lock. And you say, please, someone get me out. I'm, I'm, I'm in prison, please, someone get me out. Help, help, help. Turn the blooming key. <laughs> Twist the knob, and the door will open. Now you're free. You got yourself into this trap. You're the one who can get yourself out of this trap. I can only advise you. I can only instruct you. I can only show you the way, just as my teachers have done the same for me. I can tell you, hand on mouth, this is I speak honestly. Today, if you put a naked woman in front of me, I can look at her. Simply as Rupa, Vedana, Vanya, Sankara, Nama. Here's a man who got married to one many years ago. Twenty years ago, I got married to one. Today, I can look at the woman naked and simply see Rupa, matter and energy. Just a combination of that. Where's the room for lust? Hasn't the sasana served me? Because then I remember, before the Dhamma, before I had the Dhamma, how I could I couldn't study, I couldn't focus. I couldn't do my work. Because it was constantly, will she leave me today? Will I meet her today? Will she come to class today? I couldn't think straight because the mind was always looking for happiness. Always lingering and loitering, trying to find happiness in the nooks and the alleys of sensuality. Always lingering and loitering. Sensuality never pleased anyone. Never made anyone content. Never gave joy. Nothing more than a fleeting moment of pleasure. And that pleasure is simply relief from vexation. Once again I ask you, rise up from the ashes of your own ignorance. Set aside the burden of your own attachments and experience the bliss of unconditional happiness. You needn't be a slave to a naked woman. You needn't be a slave. You needn't be a slave to a naked man. Lust is a disease, ladies and gentlemen. It's a disease of the mind. Desire is a disease of the mind. It's not a crest to wear on your head. It's not a crown to wear on your, on your head. It's not, a, it's not a crest to wear on your lapel or put on your chest and be proud of. I have lust, look at me. So, you know, what, what I feel when, when they say, you know, the kings of the past, they used to have 500 women in their harem. 500 women and he still wasn't happy. He had women, what he didn't have was a number. 
So if there are those among you who still suffer because of lust, because of desire, if today you know you want to, you are really struggling to be faithful. If you are, if you are one of them, you want to be faithful to your husband, you want to be very faithful to your wife, but you're struggling, you're really struggling. Every day seems like a real, real grind. It's, it's really difficult because you want to be faithful, but your mind is constantly lingering and loitering down the alleys of sensuality. If you are that person, I tell you, the Dharma can heal you because you simply have a disease. There's medicine for that. If you are someone who always lives in anger, if you're always so short-tempered, little, the slightest things annoy you. And the very people who you will live with because you expect them to keep you happy, your family, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your, your, your closest friends, and even with them you can't be happy because you're always on edge. Because you always feel that people are out to get you. And you have a million expectations and none of them are ever met. So you're constantly saying things that you later regret. You're constantly doing things that you later regret. If maybe by this point you've even raised your hand, your, your hand, your arm, to attack your brother, your sister, maybe even your mother or your father, If in the process of doing so, you haven't still killed them, there's still hope for you. There's still hope. Because it ever, if it ever develops into a point where, out of a fit of fury, these things happen from time to time, you read them in the newspapers, people come and tell us, Swami knows another boy, another man, killed his mother. How do we help him? Now it's too late. Not just me, maybe not even the next Buddha can help him. Now it's too late. That's why sometimes I wonder how destiny has been so cruel, how our fate has been so cruel to us that at a time when we have no Dhamma to help us, they put us in between our mother and father. Look at how cruel it is. The two people to whom, if we do good, Great things will come in return. And just as much, if you do bad, terrible, atrocious things will come in return. Those two very people, they put us in the middle of. How like unkind, I wonder, sometimes. Fate is such. Destiny is such. But in those moments, you don't have the Dhamma. So therefore, if you feel... I hope you don't mind me sharing this with you. There are sometimes young people who come to our monastery and they say, Samyananda, I just can't control myself anymore. Those days it used to be girls on the internet. Then it used to be girls at school. And I still couldn't control myself. Then it used to be my teachers. And now it's come to a point where it's my sister. I fear that tomorrow I'm going to feel this way about my mother. Please help, Swami Nansa. Please help. They are rich, they have chauffeur-driven cars, okay? they wear the best of everything, they live in mansions, they have anything and everything they could ask for. <coughs> but like a moth, flying slowly to the fire that's going to burn it one day. These children, these young people, they slowly but Steadily keep closing, one step at a time, one day at a time, to the fire that one day is going to burn them alive. It started with pornography on the internet. Today is the system. Tomorrow, he fears that it's going to be his mother. There are young people today who, when their siblings their sister goes to the washroom, he will go and look through the keyhole. Because nothing else makes him happy anymore. He didn't start off like that. I'm relating to parts of stories that people have told me. 
without any of the names of this. Laundry goes missing. Are you disgusted? Then you're wrong. If you're disgusted, then if I put a naked woman in front of you, you'll have lustful thoughts. It's not disgust that we need. In this asana, we don't have disgust. We only discuss three things. Raga, Desha, and Mohan. We discussed Raga, Desha, and Mohan. We find that disgusting. Because what Raga, Desha, and Mohan does is it brings down great men and women onto their knees. It destroys good people. It brings out the worst in people. And great lives which would go on to have achieved great success and done so much for mankind, they perish, having committed unthinkable sins. That is why I fight is always with Raga, Desha and Mohan. The Dhamma is the only answer. Tell me next time, you know, I'm talking about a boy who has everything he could ask for. His parents are very, very wealthy. They are very well connected and any, work, any job he wants to do, he can go get any company he wants to work for, very well connected. They have got everything. They live in the lap of luxury. But he can't control himself when he sees his sister. What's the answer? Hmm? What's the answer? Shall we send him to a good university? Let's send him to Oxford. Surely he'll find the answer there, won't he? Without speaking the Dhamma, without giving me a word, before, without giving the Dhamma as an answer, give me another answer if you can. I'm interested, I'm keen to hear. Here's a boy who has everything he could ask for, 24 years of age. The reason he came and spoke to us is because he says, Swami Nanjan, my sister is going to get married. And she's going to be leaving home soon. I can't bear it. Not out of love, out of lust. Because once the sister leaves home, where is he going to get his kicks from? What's the answer? Tell me. He's tried. He's tried meditation, by the way. He's tried the meditation that he knows. Contemplating that all there is in the body is dirt, blood, pus, right? hair, and all this, the 32 parts of the body. He's tried that. This is just bones. He's, he's, he's tried staring, staring at a skeleton. In fact, he even got himself a skeleton. He has one at home. That's what he uses for meditation. He looks at the skeleton and tells himself, my sister is also just a skeleton. When he looks at the skeleton, he doesn't want the skeleton, but the moment he looks at his sister, he wants his sister. That's something that is not the meditation that, as far as I know, helps free the mind from, from Ravadesh and Mohan. It's not about closing your eyes. Today he has to do that. When his, when, he, when his sister is at home, he tries to keep himself in his room so that they, he doesn't see her as much. And here's a man who, who really is hurting. He wishes he was dead because he knows this is wrong. I can't have incestful thoughts about my own sister. But how, what can I do? I can't help it. 
So they come looking for answers. As I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, if you put aside the number, what other answer do we have? Hypnotherapy? Brain surgery? Poor people? Really poor people? Innocent people? Ragadesh and Mohan are completely destroying their lives. I mean, I can understand it, but the poor guy says, Swaminathan, please help me now because I've come to the point where it's now we've come as far as the system. I'm trying not to reveal too much in case it becomes obvious what I'm talking about, but I think it would be safe for me to say this. Sometimes what he does is he puts some, what do you call them, uh, he puts some pills into his sister's drink where she goes to sleep and the parents are not at home. Sleeping pills, that goes into the drink, sister has that, and then she goes to sleep because she feels sleepy. Parents leave. Now, I need not say what happens next. What the poor boy is saying is, what if it's my mother next? Because he understands, he's listened to a little, listen to a little bit of the number. He understands what it means to my mother's next. Because he understands that there is such a thing called the four great hells. And anything bad you do to a mother is a sin that you cannot be forgiven for for a very, very, very long time. But I've come so close. The moth is saying that the next thing that I've to up ahead is the fire. Please save me, Swami. Why or oh why? For, for 24 years, did his parents not bring him to a temple? Why did, not, why did they not give him to Dhamma? Why was it enough to simply send him to Australia and give him an education? Why was that enough? Why was an MBA the answer? Why did the parents think that if I gave my child to do an MBA, then all, all his problems would be, would be fine? But it's not. Today he lives a life of hell. Parents, I'm talking to you. If you don't know this child's name, you know a child, don't you? You know a child, and you know his or her name, then put that name. That's the child I'm talking to. You know Operation Lupia, that they're doing these days to remove drugs from the country. I had to completely cleanse, remove the, treat the, fix the drug problem. You know how many parents, how many mothers, how many fathers find out that their children have been doing drugs? All of us, it was all done under covers. No one knew, but then when the intelligence Forces and they get to find out. The narcotics, they, they find out. They inform the parents. Parents find out from the authorities. But the child's been living at home. They've been, they've been sharing a roof. They've been living at home. Parents at home, children in the next door, next door room. Right? And the children are doing drugs. The mother doesn't know, doesn't know, the father doesn't know. Until the authorities do a raid and they find out. Children in prison, now that's when the parents find out that the children have been doing drugs. Now where do you go? People are destitute. But they have money. They have power. You don't know the child's name, do you? You don't, right? But you know a child's name, don't you? That's the child I'm talking about. If you don't know 
the boy I have just referred to? Who has feelings for his sister and he can't get over them? If you don't know the boy I talked about, who got caught during a drug raid? If you don't know the girl who ran away, the boy? And now her only, her only refuge now is to go and hang herself? If you don't know their names, fear not, because you know the names of the boy and the girl who you call your own children. Who are those names? And the situation is still the same. If you don't get them to die. Once again, I tell this to you. Today, I don't know. If you bring a naked woman and put her in front of me, I can contemplate on her and not have a single lustful thought. Long live the Sangha Bhisasana. Bhisasana has made me a man today. It has straightened my back so I can hold my head high. Those days I used to have to look down in case I saw someone I should be looking at. <clears throat> Today young people have to look away when they see something in case they have thoughts, they have feelings and they can't be in control of their feelings. Today young people have to do that. But the sasana has saved me. Today I can hold my head high and I, look, I can look at any girl, any woman. and not have a single thought of lust. Why don't you believe in the power of the Sasana? So what's your fear? What are you waiting for? If you want freedom, freedom's here. Come and get it. We are hearing from the voices of those who have experienced that freedom who were once victims of their own prisons. Today, they have broken out of those prisons. And they sing victoriously. And they call you, come on. Anyone who wants this freedom, come and get it. It's free, it's available. And for as long as our hearts beat, we are here to give you the death gift that is in death. Because every man, woman and child, they deserve this freedom. You may not have been my biological mother and father in this world, but in the countless births we have been together, you have done so much for me, and we are all ready to pay back. So come and get it. So that you can live a free man. You can, free, you can live free of lust. You can live free of desire, free of anger. You don't have to be the animal that you are sometimes at home when you get angry. Remember that animal? Remember? Don't not just pretend that it's not you. Your face changes. You look like the devil in person. Your eyes go red. Yeah. Your forehead wrinkles. You start sweating. You start pulsating. And I'm pulsing in anger. Your fists do that. You clench your fists. Right? And then in that moment, you forget that you are a father. You forget that you are a loving husband. Because that's not you. Of course, that's not you. It's like you've been possessed. Yes, you have been possessed. Possessed by, this, by, possessed by aversion. That is what has happened. You're not bad, but badness gets you. Badness possesses you. So who's the Kantari are you going to get then? In those moments. I'm saying that we are the Kantari. We can help you catch that. Catch that evil spirit. So that it doesn't possess you again. Please turn that page over 
So you don't have to ever regret another moment of anger. Come on, do better than this. Come on with it, you can. You don't have to be that animal again, that beast who no one is safe when you're around. When you get angry, other times you're, you're great, you're a saint. But when you get angry, you become furious, you start throwing things here and there. How many pots have you broken by now? How many broken dishes? How many broken drawers? Hmm? How many pieces of furniture are broken? How many hearts broken? Those hearts can no longer be mended. Because you said something and to this day she still remembers. That's it. Now you try to take it back. Because one, one fine day you got angry and you said something. You, this is the wife that you so loved, but you called her. Uh, because you were angry. You were furious. Unfortunately, that left a scar. An unerasable scar. You scarred her for life. Now, she always has it. So even, no matter what you try and do today, to recover that relationship, all the flowers from there on, all the gifts, all the going outs, all the dinner outs, none of those things didn't work. Because when things go a bit sour, she come back to you and say, oh, you called me the other day, did you? You say all these things about you love me, this, that and the other, but remember that day when you, when you really lost your temper? And you called me a female dog? Remember? She would rub it in your face. Proving to you that what, what, what has been said once cannot be taken back. So all you can do is regret. Now you are hoping, what, why can't we just die soon, so that we all forget all this and we can start again? What a sorry life, living in the hope that you die as soon as possible. So bring the wife over as well, so we can help her. So we can teach her that what you have given is what you get today. It is not because the husband's bad. And so that we can teach her to look at the fact that there are no bad people. Badness got him, madam. Badness got him. He's not a bad person. Have sympathy. Understand that he's not a bad husband, but just badness got him. So all we have to do is now give him goodness. Let's give him the Dhamma. Let's help him. Then she understands. Countless people we've helped like that. People who are on the verge of divorce. You know, we are not all about splitting people up and ordaining them. That's not what we do. Countless times we have healed families. Couples who are on the verge of divorce. He gave them the Dhamma and today they live happily. They're both on the path. And now they're looking after each other like noble friends. As true friends should be. Sometimes wives come and complain about how husbands just, you know, they, they have various desires that they can't satisfy. They come up and say these things. Ramana says, what can we do? My husband is an animal sometimes. I, I can't satisfy him. What do we do? Bring him, let me talk to him. We have sympathy. Because desire has gotten got him that same. He's a good man, and so is she, a good woman. The Dhamma is the only answer, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what, more, what, what further proof you need from him. If I am here, I can stand up 
and say with, her, with my head held high. This is not a poker face. This is me speaking to you honestly. Today I can look at a naked woman and contemplate on the fact that this is merely matter and energy and not feel the tiniest bit of lust in my mind. If that is the case, I have become capable of doing that through the Dhamma. What more evidence do you need that the Dhamma is still alive? What more do you need? Where else do you need to go looking for answers? Aren't you glad you were born a Buddhist? At least that's one less obstacle you have to jump. Hmm? Just because you're a born a Buddhist doesn't mean you get to Nibbana any sooner. Right? So, come out of that thinking in case you were. Because it's not whether you're born a Buddhist, a Muslim, or a Christian, or whatever. It's whether you've understood the Dhamma, that's it. Right? But if you were born a Buddhist, at least there's no obstacle to this. There are no objections when you want to go to a serpent. There are no objections when you go to, go to the temple. But if you were born to another religion, then sometimes there are objections. So I'm saying, you know, when you have everything you need, right at your doorstep, make use of it. And as Suzila invited you, come and join our ranks. While the Dhamma is still potent, because there's going to come a time where the teachings will be there, right? or rather the words will remain, but the essence of it will be lost. That day will also come. The words will remain, but the essence of it will be lost. Just like you knew the Dhamma, way before I started the preach to you, way before you started listening to Guru Nanda, you knew the Dhamma, but it had no impact on you. You just didn't feel the essence of it, because the words were there, but the essence of it wasn't there. Or maybe you just simply didn't have the merits to understand it. I don't know, for whatever reason. But today you come up to me and say, Swami Nansa, our lives have changed beyond our wildest imaginations. I am not the same person I used to be. So don't delay it. If you are this side of 40 and you are a female, we still have the Anagarika program for you. After 40, unfortunately, we have to close the gates. It's not because we like to do that, because there are no less an ailing heart after your 40. No less. But simply for practical reasons we have to do that. For health reasons we have to do that. No other reason. So if you're this side of 40, don't delay it. That is not a guarantee that you will live until you're 40. Because what if you die on your way back home today? The veins are out again. Well, so, be careful when you drive. If your car sticks and slips on the road, that's it. Today would have been the last time you met. A tree might fall, and today may be the last time that we met. It might happen on the way for me back to the monastery. We are like a drop of dew on the edge of a blade of grass. So fragile. Have you seen a drop of dew on the edge of a blade of grass? Yeah. At any moment, you that. Life is like that way to So while you can, make the most of it. Right. Let's conclude there for today. Now I have a request to make from all of you. <clears throat> so as you may know, I'm also learning Spanish so that I can take the message of the Buddha to that part of the world. Apparently it's the second most spoken language in the world. There are some of our Swami Mahasas and Anagar Kamakis who are learning Mandarin. So they're doing the number one most spoken language in the world. The second most spoken language is Spanish. And so I and a few other, other monks and other monks will learn Spanish.
Spanish classes, though, for, for us at the monastery, is at one o'clock. So what that means is, every day I'm delayed here, I have to miss Spanish classes. So two weeks at a stretch, I missed classes. And I like it, that didn't happen. Because if I don't learn the language, then I can't teach the Dhamma in Spanish. And if I keep missing classes, then there's going to come a point where I can no longer understand anything in the class and I'll have to drop out. So I ask you to give a Dhamma. What Dhamma? The Dhamma of time. There are two things I can do. One is, we can skip the arms giving at the end. In the afternoon. That will save some time, about 20 minutes or so. Another thing is, because that's the other reason, in fact. Remember, I said there is a reason why I would look away if there was a scantily clad woman walking to the monastery, I would look away. It's because people would look at me and say, and say that I was, being, I was having lustful thoughts, right? And I was looking at the, at the right woman and I was being very unvirtuous. Now, the, the problem is this. Some of you who have shared this story with you in the past, you know that I am permitted to take my meals after 12 because I'm under on, on, on medication. Because I have an ailment for which I'm taking treatment, I'm allowed to take meals after 12. But not everyone knows this. So say we have a new member in the audience today. And a new member in the audience will observe that Swami Namas is going on Pindapata after 12 o'clock. If they ask the organizers, ask one of you, then fair enough because you can explain to them. But what if they don't? And they assume that the Swami Nas is not following the, the discipline laid down by the Buddha. Here's what will happen then. They will think badly of the Swami Nas and they might, because they haven't understood the Dhamma yet. And once you understand the Dhamma, this is not of a concern. I mean, why do you care whether someone uh, abides by the discipline or not? As long as the Dhamma helps you to free yourself from Raghavesha and Moha, that's all that matters, right? That's it. But for someone who's still just taking baby steps in the Dhamma, these kind of things can be an off putter for them. So then what they're saying is, well, this monk is unvirtuous, I'm not going to come to service anymore. Who have they disadvantaged by doing that? Themselves. So out of compassion, I need to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that they'll keep coming until they understand the Dhamma. So therefore, if we go past 12, now today is fine because now you all know this, right? But I can't keep talking about this every day. I'm coming here to do a sermon, not to tell you why I have to take means after 12. But we can't be talking about this every day, so therefore, I'm going to try and conclude the sermon by 10.30. You know, I'm really good at that. <laughs> right? What I'd like you to do, out of compassion for those people, not for me. Because, you know, let's say, you know, I, I, I take my medications and one day I'm going to go to the doctor and the doctor says, right, that's it, you're good now, you no longer, it's, it's a curable disease, so it's, it's, not, it's not a lifelong thing, but I have to be on medication for a while, and then there's going to come a point where the doctor says, you are no longer, you no longer need to take medicines. After that, if, I, if these sermons are still delayed and you still serve meals after 12, I can accept your food, but I can't have it. So, I might have to take it back to the monastery and maybe offer it to a, a devotee or an Anagarika Mahatya or actually not even Anagarika Mahatya because they also observe the same precepts as we do. So maybe to uh, someone who's just come into the monastery, right? maybe they're spending a week or so just to experience and they've observed the five precepts and they can take their means whenever. So I'll have to do that then, which I don't mind doing. But I think what would be best is if I can try and conclude the sermon by at least 10.30, 10.45.
You can of course come and pay your respects and you know, do whatever you have to do, offer your pity to her and all that. But if you can let me out of this room, at least by level or latest by quarter past, then that will be enough time for me to collect my things and get out of here in good time. So actually, if, if I can leave by 11, so if you finish the sermon by 10.30, if, we can, if I can leave shortly after, so that I, we can go and pin the path. Remember, those days we used to go to the village. We used to go to the suburbs to, to take pin the path, but you stopped all that, didn't you? The poor people who couldn't afford a square meal, you know, they offered something and then they had some merits out of it. But now they don't have that. It's not your fault. This is the way karma works. When you have merits, you get opportunities to do more merits. That's the way it works. Unfortunately, they don't have the merits yet to even do merits. It seems very unkind, but that is how nature works, unfortunately. Sometimes we have to fight tooth and nail to try and overturn that. So, what we'll try and do is conclude the sermon by 10.30, 10.45, and then you can come speak to Swami Nansi or make your renovations, and then I'll be out of here by 11. That gives me enough time to go and meet the Bhagavad, accept your arms, and have my meals before before, before 12 as well. I understand that there are some of you who will wish to discuss certain matters. Maybe you have some questions you want clarify. Maybe you have concerns that you want to address. I think the best place for that is at the monastery. Rather than at the end of the sermon here, because I, I also sometimes feel as even that I don't do you justice. Because it's not, it's not fair on me to give you an answer to a question which would actually require for me to understand exactly what your problem is. Maybe I'll have to talk to you for about an hour to understand the specifics of your problem. I can't just give you a blaster and say, try this, emphasize. Because I'm asking you, I'm giving you the dumb. And you're going to practice it after that. So what if it's the wrong advice? It's very irresponsible of me to do so. So therefore, I have to be responsible in the way that I dispense the money. So I think the best way to get advice for such matters is to meet a monk or an Anagarika monk at the monastery. And you all know how to do that. You can make an appointment and meet and have, have a session with them. So I request that we try and adhere to that, which will then make life convenient for all. But most of all, I don't want to be busy in my Spanish classes. Because there's a whole world of people out there who we need to go help. And I can't count on anyone else to do that. There are many other people who are doing that, but I can't count on anyone. I can only count on myself. As I say, if you want done, if you want something done right, do it yourself. I know I'm doing it right, so therefore I don't want to miss those lessons. So out of sympathy for all those people, the Spanish speaking world. Please let me go and join my classes sometime so that I can learn the language and help those people as well. Do we have a deal? Okay. Right, let's do the medic transfer and we'll be serving to the Let us all take a moment to transfer the mace that we have all acquired. By listening to the Dhamma, inviting the Swami Mahas to deliver the sermons, creating a conducive environment for all to practice the Dhamma. And engaging in very, very spiritual deeds. First and foremost, let us take a moment to transfer this place to the weakness and weakness. Upasakas and Upasakas who have since time in the morning protected to preserve the sublime teachings of the Buddha and passed it down through the generations of the noble lineage in the form of the Sripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand, and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also take a moment to transfer this place to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief priests of all the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us also transfer these minutes to the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin, from rain or shine. Let us transfer these minutes to my teacher, Guru Swami Mahansi, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarika, Anagarika suggestion the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these minutes to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by translating these talks, sharing them out with others, or inviting others to join them. May they all rejoice in these things. May, they, may we 
also transfer these merits to friends of the monastery and our devotees who, for the sake of merits, to help them attain the supreme bliss of Nirvana, continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes, and medicines, as well as those who pass on their know how and continue to extend their well wishes. May they all rejoice in these merits, and by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcoming obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nirvana. Sadhguru Sadhguru Sadhguru. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends and our acquaintances, our employers and our employees. As well as anyone and everyone who have helped us, supported us, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form, may they rejoice in these merits, and by the power of these merits, may they also be freed of any physical and mental ailments and overcoming obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nirvana. Sarva, Sarva, Sarva. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the devas and brahmins, spirits and demons, primarily the Sankadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have come to themselves to fulfill their sankadeva. Preserve the Sambhu Dasasana. Let us transfer these maids to all of them. May these maids have the prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nirvana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these maids. To our loved ones, those who passed away in our name, our forefathers, our ancestors, reminding us that it is in their blood, sweat, and tears today we are able to enjoy the comforts of life and practice the path in peace and harmony. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer these merits to members of the armed forces as well as the police force who sacrificed their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation, as well as friends and foe who lost their lives in the wars. Let us transfer these merits to those who lost their lives in natural disasters and calamities such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, fires, floods, pandemics. Reminding ourselves that in this infinite long journey of samsara, they will all have been mothers and fathers to us, brothers and sisters to us, friends and acquaintances to us, out of compassion, and a sense of gratitude towards all that they have done for us. Let us take a moment to transfer all the merits we have acquired to all of them. May, by the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the watery plains, they redeem themselves from the watery plains and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble way for God, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of the Sadhguru, Sadhguru, Sadhguru. And finally, may by the power and the blessings of all the merits we have acquired through all the day, we can witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of our hearts in this blessed land. Finally, you and I and everyone who has helped make this program a success to become a Rahatat Mahanse or an Arahat Training Mahanse in this very life itself and in the era of the Gulf and Supreme Lord of the Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. May the blessings of the noble religion be with you all. The members of the Mahasangha who transfer their blessings to you. Oh. 